And I'd like to welcome everybody to the first Planetarian Zoom seminar of 2023. And for this seminar, we are delighted to have Patricia Moore from NASA to uh, give us the latest scoop on uh, Artemis missions, plural, the Artemis series of missions. And uh, let, I, let hold on one second. Let me just switch to, uh, for the recording, I wanna switch to the speaker view. So we get to see that. Okay, and with that, oh, let me say one more thing. People who just came in, we have a sign-in sheet. Uh, it's called the chat. So I'll just put in the chat uh, what you have um, as your name and where you're from. That's about all we need for the sign-in. And in general, keep yourself muted as usual during these uh, video conferences, unless you have a burning question. Uh, Patricia would accept the burning questions. <laughs> questions that are not burning, you can wait till the end or put your question in the chat. She can see the chat. Since I'm on a, a new system, I actually can't see the chat very well. I mean, uh, okay, so anyway, without further ado, Patricia, thank you for coming. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. Give me a thumbs up, somebody, if you can see it. All right, cool. Yeah. All right, so my name is Patricia Moore, and I'm here in Houston, Texas, uh, but I support NASA headquarters and the Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate, or ESDMD, and most people don't understand how NASA is organized, which is fine. So my team and my group that are in that uh, mission directorates, we support communications, public engagement, for the managers that basically run all things Artemis right now. So pretty much anything that's related to planning for future missions to the moon and Mars are part of that particular mission directorate. And so my team supports a lot of our mission managers and our leadership and, and I help integrate outreach um, across the across the um, centers and across the agency to help make sure it's integrated and that we're telling the whole Artemis story or as much of the Artemis story as we can when we interact with the public so that they understand and uh, various components but see how they all fit together um, as we move forward for human and or crude we say crude missions to the to the lunar surface so I always like to kick off my presentations with a video so we can get in the space mood and get the space feels and so this video is available to all of you afterwards my whole presentation is too so I love this video it's a nice highlight reel of Artemis one and um and, and let's with that let's just get started our return to the moon will be different than the last time. We plan to explore more of the lunar surface and the learn how to The space system is now counting down to lift off of Orion on its maiden voyage to the moon. And here we go. And hydrogen burn off igniters initiate. Seven, six, five, four stage engines start. Three, two, one. Boosters in ignition. And lift off of Artemis One. We rise together, back to the moon and beyond. We are all part of something incredibly special, the first launch of Artemis. human-rated spacecraft not seen since 1972 during the final Apollo missions. Distant retrograde orbit, we're going to be about 38,000 miles away from the lunar surface. We're going beyond anywhere we ever went for Apollo. The Orion spacecraft is barreling its way back home after circumnavigating the moon and beyond in an elliptical distant retrograde orbit. Splashdown. Orion back on Earth.
All right, I get chills every time I watch it. Oh, it was so cool. So this is a picture that that was taken from Kennedy Space Center at and on top of what we call OSB2, which is a building that a lot of our management and kind of VIPs of NASA and um, White House guests and people like that get to get to view. Um, I was uh, a little bit farther down um, at the Banana Creek in the Saturn V building, and it was a similar view, and it was absolutely amazing. The highlight. One of the highlights of the things that I've ever done at NASA it was is amazing. So the, the Artemis one mission was incredibly successful and it, it and its purpose was to be a test flight for our future missions for crewed missions to the moon. So what makes Artemis different than Apollo is that Artemis, as we return to the moon, we're returning to stay we're, and we're going to learn to live on another world to prepare for Mars. And we're not doing it alone as a government agency. We are, have um, thousands of suppliers and companies across the United States and across the world that are supporting our missions and our prime contractors. And then we have international partners and it's not just, and I'll, I'll show you a map or a list of all of our partners in a bit, but it's not just the usual partners we have um, like, for example, the folks that we work with on the International Space Station, we are working with countries that we've never worked with before. So it's incredibly exciting. So Artemis 1 launched on November 16th, and uh, the, this was the first time we've launched the SLS rocket, the most powerful rocket in the world. Orion spent about 25 days out in space and came home and splashed down in the Pacific Ocean outside um, off the coast of California. And I mentioned our suppliers and our companies. There's not there, every single state in our nation touches Artemis. So there is a company, what we call suppliers, that provide some sort of component to either the rocket, the spacecraft, or the ground systems that all contributed to Artemis One. So no matter where you live in the United States, um, your state touches Artemis. And we'll add even more and more stars to a map like this as we include additional pieces of, of artists or com components of Artemis, like spacesuits and lander systems and things like that. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Space Launch System or SLS, it's the most powerful rocket ever launched. It's the power, most powerful rocket ever built to date. And it has the capability of sending crew and cargo to the moon. So its purpose is to lift really big, heavy things, lots of things, and get it into orbit. And so there's different configurations of the SLS. This is the first version. Um, we will have an expanded upper stage in the future, probably like Artemis five, six, seven, you know, at least, you know, five to six years from now, maybe a little bit more, which will allow us to carry almost twice the amount of payload. So for kids, I explain our current Artemis um, SLS rocket, the one we just launched, can carry about 12 elephants worth of stuff. This one, the next version can carry 22 elephants worth of stuff. And so when you think about really large habitats and rovers and, and large pieces of equipment that we need on, uh, on the moon, uh, the SLS is going to be able to carry the crew and all of our supplies with us. So when we finally get to that final version, which we call the Block 2, it will be one foot taller than the Saturn V rocket, which I'm sure was done on purpose. Um, but it's already, the smaller version is already more powerful than the Saturn V. We um, are using heritage hardware, so you'll notice components from space shuttle, like the boosters are one segment taller. We are using retired, kind of retired or refurbished um, RS-25 engines at the bottom. We had 12 of those left over, and then the core stage is completely new, and then Orion sits on top. So Orion is similar in shape to Apollo, but it's completely different in almost every way other than that. Um, it's 30% larger. And the the physics of re-entering the Earth has not changed, so that's why you'll see uh, why you see another blunt body designed or a teardrop design. Um, it's about thirty percent larger. It's got a um, launch abort system that will pull the spacecraft away from the rest of the rocket if there is an anomaly. Um, we call it anomaly or, or something wrong happening during launch. We need to get the astronauts to safety. The back end of the Orion is the service module. It has all of the power, the water, um, and that's built by the European Space Agency and their prime contractor Airbus. 
And here's a look at my favorite Orion photo or selfie. We call them the Orion selfies that was taken during the mission. This is on the fifth day. So as they're approaching um, the orbit of the moon and, and they're headed to a distant retrograde orbit, which takes a little bit longer than three to four days to get into because this orbit goes really close by the moon um, and then it goes really far away. So it goes about 40 um, times farther than the Apollo spacecraft orbited the moon. Um, and so it takes a little bit longer to get in this orbit. Let me start this play this one. I'm going to skip it a little bit because it takes a bit. All right, so here we go. I like this video because, oop, being cranky. You can see Earth rise. I'm messing up the story. Here we go. Oh, well. Okay. This is just crazy to me. I can't imagine being an astronaut and looking back at Earth and just seeing how small that is. That would be a little alarming for me, but our astronauts will handle the pressure. Great, I know, but that's just crazy to think about how far away that is. But there are lots of videos like this and I can provide links. Um, to my knowledge, there aren't any 360 videos of this, but um, but there could be things that haven't been released yet that I don't know about because there were several different kinds of cameras on board and some of them, we don't get access to the, to the data until you know sometimes months afterwards. So there were no astronauts or crew on board, but we did have what we call purposeful passengers um, or moonikins. And so this particular moonikin, his name is Commander Campos, and he is named after Commander Campos, um, Arturo Campos from the Apollo 13 era. And this um, Arturo Campos was responsible for coming up with the plan and was he and his team were instrumental in getting the astronauts home um, after the accident of Apollo 13. And so we had a naming contest, I think like in 2020 or 2021, and this was the name that was selected. And so he's wearing the same suit that the astronauts will wear. It's the Orion crew survival suit. And this suit is designed to keep the astronauts alive in case the Orion spacecraft doesn't support doesn't perform like we expect it to, and it loses pressure. And then the astronauts have to be able to stay in this suit for about a week. So let's say once we leave Earth orbit, for some reason we lose pressure, they have to go around the moon once and then come back. That whole process could you know, last seven, eight days. And so we have ways to handle waste. We have a waste management in the suit. There's food, there's water. So that suit has to be everything that they need to survive in case they um, lose pressure in the spacecraft. They don't have to wear it if they don't need to, um, but if there was a reason to wear it, th this will keep them safe. Arturo Campos was also uh, on board with two other Munikins. These Munikins um, were, um, contr their, this contribution was from Israel and Germany, and their names are Helga and Zohar, and they are testing radiation shielding for the female anatomy. So the male anatomy has been tested at length on the, on the International Space Station over the years, and lots of radiation studies have been done on male anatomy, but there have not been a lot of studies done on female anatomy. So um, these munikins, underneath the blue that you see, they have a synthetic tissue-like substance that is similar in density um, as human tissue, and it's got all sorts of sensors on it. And then on one of the Munikins, they have a radiation shielding vest design called ARAD that was designed by um, the Israelis and the, Ger and the German Space Agency. And we're going to test it to see um, how well, or maybe not how well it works in protecting um, the female anatomy when you're in deep space. So as you know, we're outside the magnetosphere of the Earth, and there's absolutely zero protection for these astronauts. The particles solar particles from the sun can penetrate pretty much everything we've got. And so we're looking at ways um, to minimize that impact on some of the most vital parts of our body. So if any of you are into comics, which I would hope that some of you might be, we made a, a web comic and it's really silly and fun. It's, it's more for kids, but I think you'll get a kick out of some of the humor. Our team um, designed it, our graphic designers and artists designed it, and we and our team wrote the script. And so usually we farm out this kind of thing to a third party, like the um, like you've seen um, the Cali First Woman comics. You know, this was done internally as a fun project for our team, and, and we had a lot of fun with it. So during re-entry, um, when Orion hits the atmosphere, we're coming in faster than we did during Apollo um, at about 25, almost 25,000 miles per hour. And so we're experiencing enormous amount of friction and enorm 
enormous amount of heat. We're almost at 5,000 degrees. And so the heat shield that we use is an ablative material that's built by a company and it's proprietary. So it's um, trade secret. And so uh, it's the only company in the world that can build what, what NASA needs. So it's a pretty unique system. And as it um, as the material heats up, it falls away from and burns off of the spacecraft and takes that heat with it. So the reentry process is of course one of the most dangerous parts of the mission and this was a brand new heat shield even a little bit different than what we used when we tested orion uh, for exploration flight test one in 2014 and so the heat shield performed perfectly and they were really uh, proud and excited of the work that they did so that that um friction within the atmosphere will take that spacecraft from 25,000 miles an hour to about 300 miles an hour. And, and so the majority of the, the, the decrease in speed is just hitting our atmosphere. And then once we get through that, uh, we have a series of parachutes that deploy. Splashdown. From Tranquility Base to Taurus Littrow to the tranquil waters of the Pacific, the latest chapter of NASA's journey to the moon comes to a close. Orion back on Earth. Unofficial splashdown time, 11.40 and 30 seconds a.m. Central Time. All right, so when we splash down, they're going at about 25 miles an hour. So I tell kids, it's kind of like getting a bump from the car behind you. It's not It's not too bad. Um, and so that, that, that heat shield and, and the reentry and then the series of parachutes all tested beautifully and, and, and worked just like we expected them to during the mission. So Orion's picked up by the Navy. We work um, with the Navy and they bring out a well a ship that has a well deck. And um, we have our ground systems team and Navy SEALs that are trained that have spent years training to go and recover Orion in different types of sea environments, whether it's extreme wind or really big waves. They've tested it in all kinds of different situations. Luckily that day, the weather was perfect, so we didn't have to mess with any of that, but they basically tug it back in um, into the well deck. And uh, there's the team on the sides that were all cheering and excited. They bring it in and then they fl they flood the well deck to bring it in. And then they, you know, drain all the water and they bring Orion back to California. And then it was shipped over to uh, Florida, where it is now at Kennedy Space Center. And um, they're doing final testing and, you know, and learning what they can learn. Then they'll gut it and use the avionics for Artemis II. So Artemis 1 is just one you know, component of this whole architecture of returning to the moon to prepare for Mars. And so these are all of several of the elements that we need. And I'll touch a little bit on each of them. These are kind of like the highlight, the, the items that people want to hear about most. <laughs> so um, this part of Artemis, as we move into surface operations and future missions, is really where we um, see the growth of our international cooperation. For Artemis 1, it was just the Europeans. Um, the European Space Agency, ESA, and now as the farther we get into the Artemis missions, we'll have different contributions and partnerships with all of these um, countries. And so you'll probably recognize some that are maybe a surprise, you know, uh, countries that NASA's never worked with before. So the way the Artemis Accord works is a country and their government um, uh, we have a standard operation or way of an understanding of people, peaceful exploration that NASA leads. And then these countries come to NASA with how they would like to contribute and um, what parts, you know, whether it's a, a, a part of a surface operation, science um, research, or maybe they want to build a part of the gateway or like the Japanese are considering building our surface mobility unit, our pressurized rover, you know, they all come to the table with what they want to contribute. And then we work out, you know, to make it balanced and, and to make sure all of all of the needs for the mission are being met. So if you didn't know already, we're headed to the South Pole region of the moon, and that's because that's where the water ice is. And this is a time-lapse video of the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter view of the Southern Pole. And one of the things I like to point out are the shadows of the South Pole. So it the shadows are wonky and crazy, and it's going to make it incredibly challenging to move around on, on the moon. Um, we want to go to an area that's lit for a, a huge chunk of the of the day and, and throughout the year. And sometimes the edges of the craters are one of those great places to land. But of course, there's all other criteria that has to be you know met for, to have a safe landing site. But then we also want to be close close enough where we could send robotic explorers to our water ice deposits. And so we have a 13 regions that are being considered. This was released um, 
<clears throat> before Christmas. I think it was even before. Yeah, it was before Christmas. So it was before the launch because I shared this one when I was at Kennedy. And um, hopefully we'll have a landing site announced in the next couple of years. I haven't heard any talk on where they're going, but these all have met a certain criteria that the science community and the mission management community within NASA um, have their own objectives, of course, they want to accomplish. And so they were able to come up with a set of criteria that all 13 of these sites um, represent. All right, so Artemis II is next. We'll have that crew announcement sometime this year. Um, I'm crossing my fingers and hoping it's before the summer. We'll see, um, but it'll be a huge deal. Um, we'll announce the crew that will fly on, on Orion that will orbit the moon and come back. So we won't land on the moon for Artemis II. We'll have most likely four crew. They could change their mind, but for now we're gonna have four crew and um, they will orbit the moon kind of like we did for Apollo 8. The trajectory is a little different from what I hear. Um, but it's very similar and you'll have two astronauts you can see in the foreground and then you have two astronauts that are positioned in the back and this pic picture just shows what we call um, human in the loop testing where the engineers build something that they think will work well with astronauts and then we put people inside and have the astronauts manipulate buttons switches you know make sure they have enough elbow room that can reach things and so they put the people in what they've built and they make adjustments and changes and so um pretty much the orion is is done when you think about like how astronauts move around and so this is the image is pretty old but we don't have a lot of pictures of astronauts inside of orion um this is really one of the best ones that i have so artemis 3 is next so if you think Artemis II is 2024, right now NASA's targeting 2025 for Artemis III. We always say targeting because you know, tar you know, dates can slip, but it happens. And um, Artemis III will be the first surface landing of the moon with crew since 1972. And it will include the first woman on, on the moon too, which is really exciting. Yay. And so I don't know who the astronauts will be either. You know, we've got to get through Artemis II before they, you know, make selections for Artemis III. Um, but um, there are a lot of new um, equipments and, and pieces of, of, of equipment and, and different types of technology that, that we need in order to make this happen. And one of them um, is new spacesuits. So we cannot use the spacesuits from Apollo. Um, we cannot use the spacesuits that are on the International Space Station. Those suits are like 350 pounds and they're made for a weightless floating environment. So NASA contracted um, Axiom, won the contract to build the next generation moonwalking suits. And, um, and so they're working on those right now, um, along with uh, all of our NASA engineers that um, created the prototype, the XEMU prototype over the years. And um, we'll have our new moonwalking suits um, by Axiom. And then SpaceX was selected to do a demo test of their Starship landing system. And then they will carry the Artemis III crew. And then they were recently selected for the Artemis IV crew. So NASA is doing contracts different than they used to. And for a long time, it was just one company that would get the contract and that one company would have the contract pretty much for forever. That's not the case in a lot of our of, of the new way of, of doing things. So NASA has another solicitation for landing systems and a, a different um, a company will be chosen because we are working on building up the space economy in lunar orbit. We've done a really great job um, doing that um, commercially in Earth orbit. And so now we're going to take that same model of commercial um, partnership and move that to the moon. So that way it drives the cost down. It requires these companies to invest some of their own money in the design, in addition to what NASA provides for funding. And then they can then take additional customers. So NASA won't be Starships and SpaceX only customer. And if we contract a new company in the future, um, they could you know, have their own private reasons for visiting the moon, bringing you know, civilians or other countries and you know, scientists and so forth. Gateway um, is, is kind of like a mini space station, and that, this is really instrumental when it comes to the sustainability piece of, of exploring the moon long term. So um, we need kind of an outpost, a place where we can get Orion docked to to stay safely and while in orbit around the moon. The astronauts can get out, they can um, rest and collect whatever they need to prepare for the next part of their mission to the surface of the moon. Our landing systems will be docked 
locked and connected to Gateway. Um, gate, Gateway will be in a near rectilinear orbit, which allows it pretty much access to almost all of the moon as the moon rotates, you know, we'll be able to deploy missions, not just from the South Pole, but if we wanted to go somewhere else, we'll be able to do that in the future. And the initial Gateway is really small um, with just American components. And then we have um, an expanded view, which is what you see here, where we'll grow with our um, with our international partners from JAXA, ESA, and Canada. So Canada is um, going to build a robotic arm. ESA and JAXA are looking at um, larger habitats in science uh, modules. So um, well, I'm excited to see what, what happens with that. The first piece of gateway should go up around 2024. It won't be used for the first Artemis 3 mission, most likely. I'm hearing no. They're planning that it won't be ready in time. If for, for some reason it is up and running before Artemis 3, then they may change their mission objectives or mission profile. But for now, the uh, Orion will dock to Starship and orbit around the moon, and then Starship will go to the surface and then come back up and dock again to Orion, and then Orion would bring the astronauts home. So base camp is where we're headed, right? We want to have a sustainable infrastructure where we have multiple uh, means of transportation. We'll have a surface um, a surface rover that's pressurized. Uh, we've been testing prototypes and working with Japan. Even um, in the fall, in October, we were in the desert of Arizona um, testing out um, how we work together and, and creating long shadows and, and weird kind of lighting at nighttime to see what it's like driving a vehicle and the conditions that would be um, on the South Pole. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm excited to see, I haven't seen an official announcement with what their vehicle will look like, or even an official announcement that they are for sure going to build it. But those are all the conversations that are happening right now. Um, soon there'll be a contract out for the smaller terrain vehicle, um, we've got habitat structures, folks um, at Marshall Space Flight Center that are working on ideas for habitat structures. And of course, that will be contracted out too. So it's it's going to be really exciting to see at each mission that we go, we stay a little bit longer each time and we bring more things with us until we build up a base. And everything we learn on the moon, you know, learning to live off the land, taking water and figuring the ice water on the moon and figuring out how to use it as a resource um, or different kinds of resources, whether it's rocket fuel or air or water, is all going to help us um, prepare and, and, and know what we need for, for future Mars missions. And um, there are no dates for Mars missions. People ask all the time, when are we going to Mars? Well, you know, Artemis is going to at least with the uh, profile, the mission profile and architecture they have right now, it could easily take, you know, 15 years to go through all of the missions that NASA wants to do. Um, and then from there, you know, you'll look at future missions to Mars. One of the interesting things about Gateway, um, the, the mini space station in orbit around the moon, is we're going to learn a lot about Gateway, which is going to help us um, build and, and come up with designs for our Mars transfer vehicle, which would be the larger spaceship and spacecraft that take astronauts from lunar orbit to Mars and back. Um, that spaceship would never land, so we would have like a separate landing system, but this would be your in-space um, transportation um, using maybe, you know, ion propulsion, solar electric propulsion, like um, Gateway's going to use, you know, so we're going to, we're going to learn a lot about um, space craft um, construction, because we're going to be building it and assembling it in orbit and maintenance in orbit around the moon that'll prepare for Mars. <clears throat> so these last three videos or pictures I want to show you just kind of puts what I, in per perspective, like where we've been and where we're going. So this is the famous picture from Apollo, right? And this is what Earth looked like to the Apollo astronauts. This is the lunar reconnaissance um, video that shows what the South Pole of, of the moon looks like and how different the view is going to be to the astronauts. Um, you can see those really shadowed areas, the long shadows, that which are going to be incredibly challenging when we move around and when we land. Um, and so that's this will be the view of Earth from the South Pole. And then this is the view of Earth from Mars. And so this was taken by Curiosity years ago. And you see Earth is a tiny pinprick, over 39 million miles away, depending on how the planets are moving and aligned. But um, it just shows how difficult these missions are going to be. And Artemis is going to be that backbone. It's going to be that testing ground, the proving ground. I've heard some people call it the proving ground on what we need and uh, need to do and what we need to understand um, before we head to Mars.
So I always like to show, especially when I do do this with kids, and I think this is important even for adults too, to, to realize that there are all types of careers and skills needed at NASA and aerospace, um, whether it's a, a, a skill that is with your hands, like you have welding technicians and electricians, people who have a technical background, but maybe didn't go to college. We have a huge need for those types of skills um, at NASA. And then we have folks that are software focused, um, that are engineers that support mission control, food scientists, lots of different kinds of geologists and planetary scientists and folks that study space weather. We have artists, graphic designers, people that edit, people that um, work social media and um, take pictures and uh, create virtual reality simulations for NASA for training and, and that sort of thing. So almost any kind of skill or any interest that a student would have, th there is a place for that at NASA. So that's the end of the Artemis pitch. And then I have a whole nother section that talks a little bit about resources, but that will only take like maybe five or six minutes. So I'm happy to pause here. Um, if you have any questions about Artemis, or I can just go ahead and move on to the resources. Any preference? Hi, Patricia. I do have a quick, quick question. Um, what is the the CubeSat or that that um, went with Orion to the moon? Is is it called Capstone? Yeah, there were a few. Um, I think okay. by the time we launched, there were ten. I think there was okay. thirteen initially, and there was ten. Some of them were successful, and quite a few of them were not. And so I don't have data on which ones did well, right in front oh, of. Okay, me. okay. Um, I mean, was it, it? There was one that was going to test the gateway orbit, right? Yes. 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 Did you? Um, and you? You didn't hear? You haven't heard whether that went okay or not, or? I don't know which ones did just because I haven't okay. looked into it. No one's asked me that question in the last okay. month, but I, but I can find out because one of my coworkers supports that area. And so it's been, they haven't put out any like articles or anything about it because there's all that sensitivity yeah. and, and the universities or whoever the organization is that, you know, they don't want people to know that their, you know, experiment failed until they're ready for people to know that their experiment failed. <laughs> sure. Yeah. No, I, I'm on the same board, uh, same, yeah. same boat in, in terms of like, I hadn't heard anything and like, yeah. I was like, yeah. So, so I, I was just wondering, so thanks. Yeah, I can then, I can get an internal answer for you because they I don't know if they publicly released some of that info. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't want I don't want to I don't want to bother with that. I'll, I'll wait for that. I just didn't I just, I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Is all. Nope. Um, nope. Okay. And then um and then do you have any comments on the on the thermal nuclear propulsion announcement that was this week or last week or or whatever and 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 how that fits into the or or does that even fit into the Artemis program going forward long term? I don't know if it'll fit, it won't fit into the immediate Artemis program, but it might be something that's tested farther and down the line. I know that they'll test those types of propulsion and systems before we ever put humans on it for Mars, but nuclear, um, nuclear rockets, nuclear energy, however, whatever way you're using nuclear is going to be super important. I've heard our Mars architect architecture folks talk about it all the time that um, you can't depend on solar um, energy on Mars, as we all know, um, it, it, you can't depend on it. So, um, and rocket, if you have nu nuclear rockets, you can get there faster, maybe even half the, the amount of time. So I can't speak for sure on how it will be integrated to Artemis, but I know that there'll be some level of testing before we use it for, for humans to Mars. So maybe in the later years of Artemis, we'll get a chance to, to test it out. And then my, my last question is just, now, you've seen other rocket launches. Did SLS actually feel physically feel any different from other rockets that you've seen launched before? It was way louder and way more vibration. So you, I've seen shuttle launches in the exact same spot at Banana Creek at the Saturn V building that I saw the SLS. And the vibrations that came off of that rocket physically hurt my eardrums. Like my eardrums were vibrating and it was so loud, it physically hurt. And I was about three and a half miles away, I think, is about how far we were. And with shuttle, I did not feel that way. I mean, it was loud and you could feel the vibrations and the ground and the windows would, you know, move. But um, with SLS, it, it, there was, it was painful. It was still exciting. It wasn't that painful, you know, that I was miserable. But that was something I did not experience with shuttle. Was it nighttime too? That was my first nighttime launch. I'd only seen launches during the day. And it was so bright when you go from pitch black. Well, even with the lighting around the bleachers, you go from pretty dark and then really bright. It's like the sun is rising in that one spot and it was really bright. Um, 
but yeah, it, and it was over so fast, you know, so those things that just happens and then within a couple of minutes, you know, you can't see it anymore because it was cloudy, but that initial feel, you see it launch and then it takes, I didn't count, but several seconds, five, maybe to 10 seconds before you actually feel it and hear it because it takes that much time for the sound waves to get across the water. Great, thank cool. you so much. And um, you said this is um, this is going to be on your box folder. Yeah, so it's okay. already on the box folder, but this particular version that I created from you for you is a little different because I included some resources. So I'll send you this this link too. But in the usual resource area for outreach um, presentations, it's already there. Great, thanks. No problem. Um, and just just for everyone else to know, you know, for this group specifically, you know, NASA also hires planetarium folk. You know, you're truly included, and and we did a whole talk before about you know other planetary folk who made the jump so uh, for this group specifically uh if you are interested uh keep an eye on those online job postings mm -hmm. right is it usajobs.gov or something and um, it depends <laughs> so okay. if you want yeah. a nasa position a, a civil servant government position it's usa jobs but the education folks and, and nasa just all um consolidated to one giant contract and guardians of what's it called i don't know that's oh, guardians really of honor of, yeah guardians of honor it's kind of a funny yeah. name for the contract but it's guardians of honor so if you're interested in working at nasa in the education world um that is the big contract that all of office of education is using now yeah except for you guys in caltech you're you're <laughs> you don't have to worry about integrated contracts <laughs> I don't you're know where safe. is it. You're safe there. Safe. Safe. You're safe. Yeah, they're going to do the same thing to the communication team. And we thought our team was safe, but I don't know if that's going to, I don't know if we're going to be safe or not. But, it, you know, it is what it is. As long as I have a job, <laughs> it doesn't really matter who you're working for, right? <laughs> Any other questions about Artemis? If you, we can always come back to it. Could you tell me again where uh, where we find these outreach materials or the, yes. the version of the PowerPoint slides you were talking about? Yes. It would be great to have. So I'll put it in the chat too, and and um, and I'll share this with Alan and Jeff, and then they can pass it on to the larger group, maybe even folks who couldn't come today. But we have an external box link that has all of our communication products that we use to create you know, new things, you know, so it could be graphic files, video files, presentations, sometimes there's exhibit signage and exhibit yeah, um, files for um, um, pop up, um, pop up exhibits or roll ups, you know, so we have all of these files in this one place that is open to the public and, I'll, and this is the link and I will, I'll share it with you all um, in a second as after I finish this and I'll put it in the chat. Please but, do. There's uh, no way we could write that down. There's no I way we know, could copy that I know. URL. <laughs> but it's hyperlinked. So in this presentation, when you get it, all of my pages are hyperlinked with the intention of, you know, sharing, sharing the presentation. Yeah, I know you can't write it down. <laughs> Um, the Museum Alliance, I didn't know Jeff was going to be on the call, but I but um, but I always put this in here because for planetariums, this is where your 360 videos are. Jeff takes the time to catalog and list them all and pulls them all in from the different parts of the agency. There is no other place that I am aware of that has a list like Jeff's. So this is where if you're not members already, you should be and um, and your 360 videos are in their site. Um, if you are do other STEM type things, so if you have programming around your planetarium um, or you have camps or I don't know what exactly your roles are at, at your institution, but sometimes you wear several hats, right? So um, NASA Education has just one, an Artemis page pretty much that has all of their Artemis camp guides, their materials um, for teachers and for students challenges. You know, they have <clears throat> student challenges, app development challenges, robotic and rocket challenges that if you have um, students or groups of people at your institution that want to be a part of, you could be kind of like a mentor or a sponsor for some of these things if you want. And then um, borrowing exhibits, if you didn't know, NASA has an exhibit loan program where you can borrow lunar samples, meteorite samples, space food um, models, pop-up exhibits, panels, space tools, and, um, and the link is in the notes section, but you can also just Google NASA exhibit loan program and it'll take you to the site where you can look at each center has different things that they loan so the largest collections are at johnson space center and at marshall space flight center and then maybe glenn will be maybe number three but a lot of the human space flight stuff is is at johnson space center um, and there's a lot of things you can borrow um, short term 
you know, sometimes we're lucky enough and we're accessing things that are big and you can get some long-term items like spacesuits or, you know, some people have ended up with airplanes, you know, NASA doesn't want like the DC-9 back. So it's going to stay at the Stafford Museum forever because we don't have anywhere to put it, you know, so sometimes you can get on these excess lists and, um, and, and get really large items and they're free, but you just have to pay for the transportation from wherever it is to your, your, your center. And that's, that's the the costly part for some of the bigger items. And usually there's fundraising and that sort of thing that happens to make that possible. And then lastly, I think this is my last one. Um, I showed you a map of our partners at the beginning. Well, there is an interactive Google map that you can um, look at your city and state to see which companies are currently NASA partners in Artemis. And this encompasses more than just SLS, Orion, and the ground systems. This includes, you know, um, our human landing systems and gateway and suits and things like that now. And we update it once a year. So right now we're taking in information from all of our prime contractors and then they will give us the names of the companies that they want represented. And then we'll get it updated probably sometime before the summer. Um, but you can use this. I tell museums and, and planetariums, this is a great tool to use to seek out sponsors and companies you didn't know existed in your area that are a part of NASA's space program. And so it'll tell you the name of the, of the company and what city that they're in, their base is. And then it's up to you to kind of help make those connections. We don't, I don't have, you know, phone numbers and addresses for all those people, but it gives you um, maybe some new partners or new potential funding sources that you didn't have before. And this is me. So here's my email address and my NASA phone um, that you guys are always welcome to reach out to me. Um, you know, you have great relationships with Jeff and the uh, Museum Alliance. And if if Jeff doesn't know where it is and know what what <laughs> what how to help you, you know, he he is really great with reaching out to me, and I'm I'm happy to help when I can. Um, I will tell you, I don't have any collateral to give anyone. So if you ask for giveaways. It's all gone. It doesn't exist. Um, it's, it was all given at launch. We have nothing right now, but we're gonna we're having a big team meeting in February, and we're gonna look at what we want to order for the next year. And so maybe by the summertime, I might have some things. And so if you have a specific event and you need something like a hundred of this or a hundred of that, I can't send you thousands of stuff. You it never hurts to ask. I'll, I will send out the call to the different programs and our headquarters team to see if they have a small number of things available for you. And, and then we'll, we'll ship them out if we can, but I, no promises, you know, especially right now, there's, there's literally is nothing. <laughs> we get requests all the time and we're having to turn people away. And that's it. That's it for me. Um, I'm going to put some of these links in the chat right now, while you guys are thinking of other questions you might want to ask me. Well, first of all, I think we need to thank uh, Patricia. That was amazing. It was oh, really welcome. good. Everybody feel free to unmute and, and uh, you know, we're going <laughs> to questions, but also feel free to nice uh, job. give hey. a round of yeah. applause. <laughs> Very cool. That, Appreciate that the visuals. All right. So this is the box link to our Artemis resources. It should be open. Somebody test it right now to make sure I copied and pasted the, Got it. the right one. Okay, good. <laughs> so it's all... Um, you can see what the folders look like. There's like a video folder and there's a graphic folder and there's a presentation folder. So you can just dig around in there. Um, and usually it has the most up-to-date stuff in there. I haven't looked at it since after launch, to be honest, things have been kind of crazy. So there might be some new renders of lunar surface stuff that's not there right now. I'm pretty sure I updated it, but I don't know. I, there's new images that are released all the time. And so I try to go in there and update things. So you have one place to look. But another good resource that I didn't put on here are the, the Flickr accounts. So NASA has an Orion Flickr and an SLS Flickr, and I think there's an Artemis Flickr at Johnson Space Center too. And so those are the, the best pictures that they have. And, um, and the uh, different videos and um, stills and time-lapse videos of Orion are all on the Artemis Flickr for Johnson Space Center and the Orion Flickr. Um, you won't be able to find them on the main NASA website. You might find a few that were featured in articles, but they don't just dump them all there. I mean, that, that leads into my question, which is where will the dump be? Because like you said, there's going to be tons of images that, yeah. that haven't been released yet. Where where will, do you know where that database is going to be, the just it's, raw images? 
Well, usually it's imagery online, but I don't think anyone's had time to dump all of them there. So the each of the programs have taken onus on the, their favorite pictures or the things that are best for them. Um, and they've uploaded it to their Flickr accounts. And so I wouldn't count on any one person at NASA taking the time to upload thousands of videos to imagery online anytime soon. I would. Um, well, I'll do I, it. Yeah, you'll do it. <laughs> you'll do it. I, do I it. would stick with the Flickr account. That's what we use internally, okay. you know, because um, sometimes you can find things on imagery online. But like I said, someone has to take the time to upload them and they have to write a little description about what it is and all that stuff. And so the Flickr accounts is where I go to find um, visuals that are approved, that are not our, our we call it ITAR protected, you know, um, that we can use. I have a... Um... I just wanted to mention that uh, we don't have any hard cutoff time for this, so we can we can stay okay. for questions. But um, well, as long as long as you can stay, I'm good. Um, but I do want to remind people who came in late that we do have a sign-in sheet. Uh, if you didn't sign in, just put your name. It, the sign-in sheet is called the chat. And you just <laughs> put your name and where you're from in there. Uh, but we can continue as 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 long as uh, as long as Patricia can stand this here. <laughs> I can stay in you for a little bit longer. <laughs> okay. It's all good. I don't have any um, meetings immediately after this. My next appointment's not until like 4.30 tonight. So I don't think I'll be with you quite that long, but if you have questions <laughs> for the next hour, uh, I can I can stay. <laughs> I have one one quick question actually. Sure. The In the video, this was related to the first part of the presentation. In the video, um, where the where the capsule was being brought into the recovery ship, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't see where the astronauts actually would get out. At what point did the astronauts get out of that capsule? That's a good question. So I'll bring up the capsule so at least people can see what it looks like when I talk about it. Uh, share screen. Okay. So actually, there were no astronauts there. <laughs> but if there were, if there were, I get what you're asking. Um, so if there were, it would depend. There's a couple of scenarios. If they needed to immediately get them out, they could get them out there in the water and open water if something was wrong and they needed to get them out quickly. Um, but the best scenario is everything's fine and they're just going to tug them inside of the ship and, and, you know, and then let them get out once they're inside the ship. So in this picture, you can't really see it. These are all windows. I'm trying to see if there's like a better picture of Orion. Orion has two hatches. My computer's frozen. Great. Um, has two hatches. It has one on the side and then it has one on the top. You know, so technically if you were, uh, they could go out either way. And Orion, when it lands in the ocean, it has those little um, balloon type things that are on top. Those help orient the, the spacecraft and make it land um, the way we want it to. And this is our preferred egress, as we call it. Um, is straight up, but it could also be upside down. And so we train in the neutral buoyancy laboratory. If the Orion spacecraft is upside down or right side up, how do we get the astronauts out? And how do you, you know, get it in a position where it's safe to remove them? Um, and those are, there's some, there's some interesting videos um, and images of that too. And it, they're on the Orion Flickr, I think. If you look at, um, egress, they call it egress is, you know, practicing the astronauts, practicing getting out of Orion in the water. So, in some of the pictures, I don't know why I'm there it goes. No, it's still the backside. Still can't see it. There, yeah. The hatch was covered up too. I'm trying to see if a better picture. I do have this one. You can see kind of where the hatch is in the Artemis II picture that I showed you of the trainer. So here you go. So that there's one hatch right there off to the right. So up top, they can open that, and then there's a hatch off to the side. Thank you. No problem. And Philip has his hand up. Hi, Patricia. I teach uh, physics and astronomy at a community college. I always seem to be the one to ask this question. Uh, let's talk about the metric system. Um, there's uh, There seems to be tension between engaging the public and using old fashioned units, but also NASA's educational goal of, of you know, uh, preparing the next generation of scientists and explorers. I'm just curious, so without, without 
imposing any values or anything, I'm just curious what kind of discussions, if any, have gone on among the NASA outreach team, because this could be an opportunity to promote the more commonplace use of the metric system. So the metric system is used primarily in all of our education materials. And so if there's any calculations done, at least of the things that I've seen, it's al almost always in, in metrics. Um, as far as communicating, um, sometimes we'll have both on the screen, but the if we were to tell the average American that we were going, let's say 25 kilometers an hour, they'd have no idea what we were saying. You know, So we'll, we'll probably stick with miles per hour when we're verbally communicating, but in a, a lot of our written, articles, you'll see both metric and, um, and standard. Um, I can't tell you when we would make a transition to only use metric in communicating. I know if, if we did that, we would immediately be, be told like, you know, people don't know what you're talking about, you know, so, so I think there's a balance at least right now to visualize one or the other. So if we're saying kilometers, we're then showing, you know, um, the standard and, and vice versa. But I'm pretty confident that most of the education materials and activities have used metric. It's good to know. Thank you. Of course, 25,000 miles per hour or 40,000 kilometers per hour means means about the same thing to, right. to a lot of people that just yeah. really, really fast. Um, yes, really fast. <laughs> right. In a couple of occasions, I think just because of things, things have been shown on TV, I've had to, for my students, we've had to take the public outreach materials in miles per hour and so on, and then convert them so we can actually do a calculation. But it's good to know that the written materials at least contain uh, contain both. So thank you. They should. I can't say they always do, but I know that there is an effort, especially since um, we've been working a lot really closely with ESA on this last mission. And so, and a lot of our combined things, you'll find them both, but it's a good thing to consider and remember. And, you know, I'm going to this big meeting on, on when on third in February. So I'll remind people that the more inter, especially the more international cooperation we have, you know, we Americans are the only ones that use standard at this point, you know, we should make sure we include, include both. Thank you. Yeah, regardless, always label your units though, right? Yes. Because we all yes. remember that that ill fated <laughs> Mars lesson. mission. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure when NASA talks and when they do science and when they are amongst themselves, they use metric mostly. I mean, I'll hear our engineers talk in meetings using metric, but when we communicate with the public, you'll hear standard. Metrics is easier to do science with. <laughs> I have a question that is actually directed not not as much for um, Patricia, although it is for Patricia, but it's also for these planetarian experts that we have attending here. And that is, uh, you don't re really, a lot of times you don't need a 360 or a 180 uh, visual. Like, uh, I'm thinking in particular, one of the images you showed, Patricia, was uh, out in space, you know, with the spacecraft and the earth mm -hmm. in the background or the moon in the background. Those things, I think, can be projected in the dome. Um, this one right here? It might, it might require uh, some morphing or something. I'm not sure. Uh, does anybody here have that? That's exactly one that I was thinking of that it could be projected in a full dome, but you might have to do a little morphing on it. Does anybody know about how that works? Yeah, it would just be a little warped if you, you mean if you tried to put it across the entire dome, right? Yeah. Yeah, it would just, it would just look a little weird around the edges um, for the most part. And it depends on the resolution, of course. You know, someone was asking me, um, you know the the ones that that they released during the mission were actually scaled down from the ones that that are being stored on the on the hard drives on the actual spacecraft and so we we just have to wait for for like i said until, until all that stuff is released um publicly before we can share it with everybody i bet there's a lot of images that would without much uh tampering would go well on a, on the whole dome so if I find some things that are high enough resolution and large enough, what a lot of us can do is to attach the image to a curved polygon that will, that will project over most of the dome, not all of the dome, but take into account the curvature of the dome. 
And that's not hard to do. A lot of us have models like that that we can put the image on. Because if you were to just take a flat image and blow it up larger and larger on the dome, the curvature of the dome is going to create a distortion. So there are a lot of us who have models that are already pre-made into the system and you attach that image to something that's pre-curved that allows you to blow it up much larger on the dome. That's exactly what I was talking about. That, that you warp you warp the image so it looks right on the dome. Uh, this is Rosemary. I just I have a question about the resources again. Um, Patricia, you mentioned the Museum Alliance, and my thinking is that resources are moving to NASA Connects, and I just wanted to see if if there's anybody who can add more information to that well today's my day off so <laughs> um, but but uh, what what Remember, questions do you recording. want to know rosemary we're uh, yes we're okay um yeah we, we are we are moving to the new connects platform that's just uh the new platform that that nasa is moving us to you know our, our website our old website was like 10 years old already so it was growing long in the tooth so we needed something new and, and NASA HQ said here we have this new connects platform and, and so now they're now we're there. Um, but it did you have a specific question about it, Rosemary? Uh, well, I I just noticed that it wasn't mentioned, whereas the Museum Alliance was mentioned uh, during Patricia's talk. And that's my fault. I don't work for the Office of Education and STEM engagement. And so I might highlight a few, you know, things that I already had in my presentation. Um, but I'm not as familiar with Connects. I know a little bit about what they do, but I'm not embedded in all things that education is doing. So think of communication and public engagement, outreach, social media. That's like one bucket of NASA. And then you have STEM engagement is another. I cross over a little bit here and there, but I'm not familiar with everything education is doing. So there, there may be some resources, um, there may be a lot of resources uh, based on the, the sources that you've given us that don't make it into NASA Connects. Then. There might be because we we don't t I mean we could but we don't typically share that box link to every single teacher on the planet those mm -hmm. box links are designed for people who are creating products and communication products outreach products people like you who are creating things at your planetarium and so we share that with our museum and science centers and planetarium partners that link you will never find online you know right. anywhere and so um and so when when I sometimes I try to depending on who I'm talking to I try to customize like what resources I'm showing what I think people would be interested in I didn't realize that there was a large number of planetariums that were already connected with connects but I know that they have some of my stuff like my presentations and things like that they're always asking me for my most recent presentations because I think that they upload them there so there might be some of the things I showed you already there but I, I don't know for sure I'll have to I can ask and see you know what's what's overlapping uh, that's okay. I was just trying to get that perspective of the two separate um, parts of NASA. I hadn't really appreciated that. Yeah, there, NASA considers STEM engagement and outreach separately. It's there to me. It's kind of the same, but they have a very different distinction because of funny funding. So outreach is sharing NASA's story, engaging, inspiring. STEM engagement is you know science standards, teaching um, you know um, next generation standards, and doing inter, in, um, educator professional development and student challenges. More focused on schools. You'll still see our folks do outreach at schools, but that would be like an engineer going out and talking about what they do. Um, you wouldn't you very rarely would ever get an engineer sit down and do a hands-on activity with kids. That would probably freak them out. <laughs> you might get a few that would be willing to do that, but most of them will go in and just talk about what they do. So we see it as two different things, but we do realize that there is overlap here and there. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is something I've mentioned previously, Rosemary, that you know, NASA is so huge. There is no one who has everything, right? There's no one person, no one department who has absolutely everything and literally that's why patricia and i have a job right because we are here to help you find what you need um so if you have a specific um purpose you want to make a planetarium show whatever um you you it i usually just tell people to just ask and, and i'm and we'll get you what you whatever we can yep and sometimes the asks are really unique like 
things and files and stuff I didn't even know existed. And usually if it's human spaceflight related, if Jeff doesn't know exactly who to go, he'll go to, he'll ask me, and then I start digging around and trying to find. But we've been able to get things that were not available to anybody available to folks. You know, um, we just have to ask and see if it exists. Danny knows all about that. She's made planetarium shows with us before. <laughs> And sometimes NASA doesn't have what you need and you have to create it on your own. <laughs> and so she, she her, yeah, which you guys did. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have actually a question. I posted it in the chat, but it's probably like long gone. Um, oh, it's, sort of, it's sort of the flip. It's like, you know, so we all have our planetariums and our platforms and science institutions and other universities, all of that. Like how, what are the messages that you would like for us to be like, promoting. And the reason that I ask is specific. We have a, a massive like institutional Mars celebration spotlight that's going to be happening for most of this year. Um, and we're trying to think about like the messages, like how can we help NASA? How can we help like workforce development? Like how can we reinforce all of these things that you are um, doing that, that are awesome? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I will have more to share with you after this meeting in, in February. But we have an old document that's probably in that box file um, that's from years ago that is high level moon to Mars strategy messaging for in, in the, the statements that we want to share depending on who the audience is. So if it's legislators, if it's like university stakeholders and science communities, if it's the public, if it's teachers and kids. And we, and we had all of that created probably seven or eight years ago, and it was a really great document. And then since then, we haven't all gotten together and created something new. It's really hard to get everybody at NASA to agree on talking points and key messages. Um, and so that's what, that's what the start of this February meeting is. Uh, we're really going to be focusing on what we call the space between. So what are we doing to communicate and keep the excitement and engagement going between Artemis 1 and Artemis 2? So Because there's going to be, you know, at least two years, most likely, before, between the two of those missions. Um, and so that's one of the things I can bring up um, is that we have some talking points and, and things in the presentations that we create, but we have we don't really have a new strategy on how we want to move forward yet. And that's that's what February is for. And I would just um, add that, you know, in Patricia's uh, presentation, I think she, I think you made a really good through line of no matter where you are, no matter who you are, no matter what you're interested in, there's a place for you at NASA. There's a place for you to contribute to space exploration. And and it's an exciting time to be alive and to be a part of this industry. And then that supplier map, if you want to go in even more detail, you can tell them specifically the names of the companies that are in your area or in your state. And you, they may have family members that work there. I do that, you know, when I do visits. And if I go to places I've never been before, I look up and I'll name companies and some kid will say, oh, my uncle works there. You know, I was like, well, your uncle could be building something that goes on the rocket. You know, that's that's cool, you know. Yeah, and the industry has, has broadened so much mm -hmm. just in the last few years. Yeah. You don't have to have a NASA.gov email to be mm -hmm. contributing to space exploration anymore. It's 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 wide open, really. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm talking like student internships even mm -hmm. um, is is really is really something that I try to tell people to to share and make sure that you that all of your audiences and all of your students are aware that there's a there's a place for for you if this is what you're interested in. Yeah, we just hired a, a communication intern, and she is going to look across our current audiences that we engage with and, and look for groups that are either underserved or non-traditional audiences that we can engage with differently, you know, and so that's going to be her project for the next, you know, three or four months um, as we're, you know, trying, trying to reach and, and communicate with people that we, you know, that aren't always, you know, interested or don't know about NASA or aren't interested in NASA that are non-traditional audiences. How low does your do your internship programs go, Patricia Johnson, at, at least? Um, yeah. Just high school? Um, not at Johnson. There are, okay. are a few centers that might have high school. I think Glenn does. I think Glenn might be the only one, actually. Um, but that would be online. So if you if you search NASA internships, so it takes you to one portal um, and you can kind of see the variety of internships there are. There are those that are just internships to get experience. And then there's the government version, which they call pathways, which is the pathway to becoming a NASA employee. And you come for three, sometimes four tours, you know, and so you're extending your 
college probably by a year, maybe even two years by doing this. But the idea is that when you're finished, you have a job at NASA. Um, the one-off internships or two-off if they want to come back are just um, experiences more so and not a, a really a promise for a job. But they get paid. They're paid internships, which always frustrated me because, you know, educators, <laughs> we get nothing when we go, <laughs> when we do our internship. Oh, yeah, you got to pay for your school and work full time. And sorry, we're not giving you any money, but the, uh, the students' internships are paid. Jenny, did I interrupt you? Um... No, I was just thanking you for all of that because um, it's it's really helpful. And that that like Mars for all is kind of like the that's that might be our overarching like message yeah. um, that we're working on with our marketing team. So I love it. And the more of it we can do and, you know, I'll kind of do together networked. I feel like it will make a difference. So thank yeah. you. I'm really hoping we can we we won't come out with that magic document that I'm talking about in February, but I know it's one of the topics, you know, coming um, to coming together with a key focus of, uh, you know, talking points and key messages that we want moving forward, because we got people were picking up on it for the last year. I mean, you would hear, you know, you've done something right when you hear the reporters repeat exactly <laughs> what you've been saying. Right. And people are saying it over and over again in different broadcasts and, you know, um, saying exactly what we wanted everyone to say. And it, and it worked out really well, at least for Artemis one. So now we've got to move on and, and move and move, move into the next series of missions. You know, I noticed uh, in your, in your, in, you don't have to bring the slide up, I don't think, but the slide that showed international uh, cooperation, yeah. um, the international partners, I, I just noticed that, that I was surprised at what a lot of, you know, how many there were mm -hmm. and how, you know, how varied they were. And I noticed that Ukraine was in there. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't see Russia. Russia? No, Russia's I'm not. So that some something happened along the way. We used to have cooperation with Russia. So we still do. I mean, Russia was a part of Artemis years ago, and then that changed. They are still a partner in the International Space Station, and that hasn't changed. Um, they might change their mind. We'll see. Um, but for now, they have opted to um, to to go their own way, and they may even partner with China too. I've, or, I've, I've read that in the news too. So. Um, because China has a lot of their technology already. They've, they've been selling it. Russia sells to anybody who will buy them. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so the Chinese, if you look at a lot of their space station and their rockets, they're pretty similar to Russian technology. But uh, yeah. I think that's a pretty safe reply. We are still recording here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, I could stop the recording uh, and uh, we can, um, let's see, people have left and uh, it's been great that you can stay and, and answer questions. This has been really fantastic. Um, I think I will, let me see if my system, I think, I'm going to stop the recording now and then anything off the record anybody wants to say, <laughs> <laughs> that'll be the time to say it. Um, Okay, here we go. Um, and again, thank you, Patricia. This You're has welcome. been a really, really amazing, amazing presentation. I'm, I'm thrilled, actually, and I think everybody here has been thrilled with it. Yeah. And I'm so glad that we have recorded it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention um, is that in the summertime, we try to do a really broad um, virtual outreach campaign with museum science centers and planetariums. And I'll send Jeff a note when I'm ready <laughs> in the spring. It's usually like in late April, early May, um, when I get an idea of what my summer travel schedule will be like, then we will send out a note saying, hey, first come, first serve, who wants to have a speaker for your summer program? And, um, and, and I will do my best, especially if you have an audience that is not elementary kids, I, um, I do my best to get you an actual engineer that works um, on Artemis. But if you're, if you're a primary audience or, or younger children, then I usually do those events because some of our engineers feel more comfortable talking to older kids and, and the younger kids just have a hard time with the NASA and technical speak that we usually get. 
from them. But um, but yeah, so just keep that in mind. And, and if you're you've got to be a Museum Alliance member to know about it. So if you're not one already, you know, make sure you sign up. And then usually in the late spring, I'll send out a note saying, hey, you know, send me your your request and then we'll do we do our best to to get everybody an engineer we did we didn't do as many last summer because we were trying to launch that summer so we only did maybe like 50 or 60 but the summer before i did almost 100 it was crazy That's but but our 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 engineers they love doing it and virtual is really easy you know they just pop in and pop out um and it's it's a great time for them to talk about their work and um and then talk about you know just the broader mission the presentations are usually 15 to 20 minutes unless you have an adult audience and then we'll do something longer kind of what i did for you and daytime is preferred it's really hard to get people to commit tonight i know a lot of planetariums have night programs and so i end up doing those a lot of the time because i can't get any of the engineers or it's really difficult to get someone in the evening you know to to do events well you might hear from me about because we might want one of those for a planetarium zoom seminar yeah in the future that would be great yeah. Yep. And if you have a preference on topic, because, you know, think of the all the things that I talked about, there are people from suits and human landing systems and Orion and SLS, there's a large variety of topics and the Artemis, the greater Artemis story will be intertwined in that, but they'll talk about their area a little bit more in depth. 